Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word and that you speak to us. We thank you for Isaiah 53 and your clarity and challenge. And I pray that you would speak to us today. Through Christ we pray. Amen. So if your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 53. As I was studying through this to get ready this week, I thought, you know, that I, I might entitle this, He Doesn't Look Like a Savior. He Doesn't Look Like a King. And Isaiah 53 is one of those passages in the Bible that if we continue doing these devotionals, I will probably come back to with some regularity throughout the year. I remember hearing it uh, quoted on Sunday mornings when I was a kid and, um, and, and thinking, every time thinking, it's just so meaningful. I don't know that we can read it enough. But if Isaiah were, if the Bible were uh, a, 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 a basket of gems, Isaiah would be one of its most precious. And the thing about looking at the gem is you can look at it at different angles and appreciate different parts of its beauty. Well, today, I want to share it with you again, looking back on this and look at it from new eyes. This is a passage that the people of Israel could not understand. And it's a passage that I would suggest to you that people in the United States in 2020 still struggle to really understand, that I still struggle. I don't want to just put it on others. I still struggle to really understand in a practical and daily way. Isaiah 1.1. Who has believed what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Isaiah 1 is kind of the preface. Isaiah, that verse 1 of chapter 53 serves as a preface for the whole book. Who has understood our message? is what some uh, translations say, or who has believed our message. This is the struggle of Isaiah. Isaiah is about to share the story of the Messiah, the picture of the Messiah, uh, an understanding of prophecy of who the Messiah will be. And yet he knows, even as he writes this, people aren't going to understand. The answer to his question is, nobody understands. Very few understands. Can you imagine his frustration? He is a prophet of God. As God's prophet, he's bringing a message of salvation. He's telling the story of the Savior who will come. The people of Israel are like, you know, uh, uh, driving a car off a cliff. And Isaiah is crying out, listen to me. I have your salvation. I have your answer. And even as he does, he's exasperated by this thought of who will believe our message. Who will understand? It's the frustration of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul actually quotes this in Romans chapter 10 when he says, not all obeyed the gospel for as Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our message? Paul knew what it was like to preach the gospel of Jesus, the truth of the cross of Jesus, and have people just not listen or not be willing to understand. This is our frustration as disciples who seek to make disciples of Christ. We try to share Jesus, the love of Jesus, the salvation of Jesus, the way of the cross leading home. And yet many just have, you know, their fingers in their ears refusing to listen. The answer is, sadly, not many. The question is, Will you and I be among those who are confused and who don't believe, who don't get it? Or will we be among those who follow? His frustration intensifies when he says, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, the people of Israel have seen the strength of the Lord for centuries. They saw it certainly in creation. As Moses described the creation, they certainly saw it in Egypt as God supernaturally provided for them Moses, provided for them in the wilderness, provided for them a promised land. They certainly have seen it through the stories of Israel, David and Goliath, 
you know, they've seen it, experienced it in the temple that where, 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 where God and Shekinah glory would show up. They've seen it all over. And yet they've seen the arm of the Lord. They've seen the strength. And yet they, they still don't believe. And isn't that like we are? I know it's like I am. Yeah, I believe that God can use David to take down Goliath. I'm not quite sure he can use me to take down the Goliaths in my life or the Goliaths in my age. Why is the question provoked? Why can't people hear God, see God, and believe his message? Why don't they understand and follow? And if you think about it, the answer is really clear. What is God's re greatest revelation of himself? Jesus Christ. Jesus would come, revealing God's character. Jesus would go to the cross. And still, most people did not believe. After 33 or some years, after three and a half years of ministry, God had revealed himself through Jesus Christ his son, incarnate God, and yet still most didn't believe. And when Jesus died on the cross, still most didn't understand. So let's be humble when we come to this question. Who's believed this? We've seen the power of God. We've seen God reveal himself to us in miraculous and spectacular ways. But why don't we believe? Why is it so hard? Oh, by the way, I ought to mention, for centuries before Jesus, the Jewish people didn't understand. The Jewish teachers didn't understand Isaiah 53. They could understand the conquering king passages about the Messiah. They could not understand the suffering servant passages. They couldn't understand Isaiah 53. And to this day, every year there is a Jewish reading through the Old Testament. And guess what? They never read Isaiah 53. They read Isaiah 52, they write, read Isaiah 54, but to this day they cannot understand Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? Today most people will still miss him. The question is, will we? Because he doesn't look like a savior. He sure doesn't act like a king. Verse 2 and 3. I think we miss him because we're impressed with the wrong things. See, he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sufferings who knew what sickness was. He was like somebody people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. Certainly, I think people turned away from Christ when he was on the cross and he had been beaten and was so, was so unattractive. But I think that Jesus was probably generally unattractive, unimpressive in worldly standards throughout his life. What impresses you? I have to make a confession. I get impressed by the same things that impress other people. Have you ever noticed how mediagenic some preachers are? Have you ever noticed that preachers of like big churches uh, don't look like Barney Fife, you know, or Otis, uh, the, the the town drunk in, um, in in Mayberry? I know some of you are saying, Brett, you can get some illustrations after 1960s, can't you? No, maybe not. But anyway, no, they, they look like, you know, they look more Tom Selleck, you know, than, than Barney Fife. And, and there have been times I've thought, okay, I'm making a confession, don't hold it against me, or go to another church because you think I'm an idiot, because I am. But anyway, there have been times I've thought, you know, if I could look more like Tom Selleck in the pulpit, you know, if I could talk more like Charlton Heston as Moses, you know, in, in the, the, the Ten Commandments. I have this voice that by nature just gets really high and squeaky and goes too fast. And it's really hard to be authoritative when you're short and pudgy with a voice that's like, come on, kids, repent. I really mean it. You know, it's just got to. And I thought, man, if I could just have a different appearance, maybe people would 
listen more. Jesus didn't have any of the privileges, any of the advantages of attractive appearance, of what would attract people to him. Usually when we think about people that are attractive, we think of things that we value. What do we think of? We think of success, appearance, intelligence, education, accomplishments, fame. You know, other people give them applause. Other people think they're great. They have status. They have, they're innovators in some way. But I think if Jesus was any of those things, I think if Jesus like was personally really handsome, that people might be able to say, well, of course they follow him. He has this handsome, attractive appearance, and he has this charismatic personality. I think Jesus was more Woody Allen than, um, than Tom Selleck. You know, I think, I, I don't think there was anything about his appearance. The things that we value were not the things that people expected in a savior, in a king. To put it in more modern language, he, he never would have been asked to be a conference speaker. He never would have been um, uh, in some kind of contract with a publishing company to write a series of best-selling books. He never would have made the front page of a Christian magazine, you know, the front cover picture, and because the article is about an interview of Jesus. Again, he was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we did not value him. See, the danger here in what I'm saying is I, I'm tempted to say, right now you're tempted to say, well, I wouldn't have despised Jesus. I would have valued Jesus. As soon as we do that with the Bible, we're lying to ourselves. That's proud, isn't it? Pride says, oh, I'm better than those people. No. Truth, humility says, I put it, probably would have despised you. Why would I have despised Jesus? What are, what's messed up in my values and the things that I am attracted to that need to change? Because Jesus was despised and, retract, and, 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 and rejected. See, most people today are too shallow to value the things that Jesus valued. It's just easier to be impressed with what impresses the world. Verse 4, yet he himself bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. Jesus lived a humble life. He was not a self-promoter. He served and he sacrificed. He voluntarily lived for others and to honor God, and people looked down on people like that. People looked at him and said, what, path what a pathetic way to live. You know, how sad, what a shame that God has not blessed his life more so that he could have more success and ease and a nicer place. Because what humans honor, God often does not honor. What humans dishonor, God honors. Verse, 50, verse 5, and here's the real picture, by the way. Here's the upper story. While we devalue Jesus and his way of living, look at what Jesus did for us. Upper story. Here's the truth. He was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was upon him and we're healed by his wounds. So while we were despising him, while we were thinking he's a loser, while we were thinking, man, it's a shame that God hasn't blessed him more, while we were thinking he's not very attractive, he was doing all of that for us. We all went astray like sheep. We've turned to our own way. The Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. The power of that passage is inescapable. So this makes a good moment for us to pause and to ponder and to chew on this the rest of the day. And the question I want to encourage all of us to chew on devotionally today is simply, why do I find the cross so hard to believe? Why 
do I miss sometimes the power of the cross because I'm having a hard time following in Jesus' way? The way of the cross leads to life, a life that you and I need, a life that the world desperately needs. Let's pray today that God would show us his way because all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the sins of us all to set us free. And now that's our calling in this world to set this world free by that message of Jesus. Heavenly Father, lead us in your way this day. Help us to believe what we don't believe, to see in the cross what we're missing so that we would be de delightfully distinctive in our generation. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Chew on that, and I hope you'll come back tomorrow as we get to share the rest of the passage here, this powerful passage of Isaiah 53.